Let's take our Bibles, please, and we will turn to Luke chapter 10 as we begin our service, uh, our, this part of the service tonight, in Luke chapter 10. And we really wanted to just um, uh, share the testimonies of those who went to North Carolina and to let you know where we were. We know it, we talked a lot about it, and we have um, taken up offerings, and you've been praying for us, and so we wanted to report to the church where we were and what we did and uh, what we saw there. So we're going to be sharing that with you in here in just a little bit. But Luke chapter 10, please look at verse number 25. Luke 10, verse 25, And behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tempted him, saying, Master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And he said unto him, What is written in the law? How readest thou? And he answering said, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy strength, and with all thy mind. I wonder how many of us have ever done that. And then the second part of that, you see, uh, it says, And thy neighbor as thyself. That's the two great commandments, to love God and love people. Jesus said on those two commandments, saying all the other commandments. If you love someone, you're not going to lie to them. You're not going to steal from them. And so, and you're not going to, uh, you know, hurt that relationship by coveting what they have. On those two commandments, saying all the commandments of God. Verse 28, and he said unto him, thou hast answered right. And here's the problem. He said, this do, and thou shalt live. And you see, this is where... Um, the uh, falsehood comes into people's minds, that somehow they convince themselves because they know what is right, um, that they are justified in the sight of God. No, it's not the hearers of the law that are justified, it is the doers of the law. And so we have to do these two things and keep the commandments and keep the commandments of God perfectly if we are to live by those commandments. And so he said, this do and thou shalt live. Now the problem is that no one, but no one has ever done those things perfectly. Therefore, the road to life through the commandments of God is shut tight. And, you know, the thing is now God, you know, he, he, what the Lord Jesus is doing here, he's pointing out to the man what the standard of God's righteousness is. And if a, a person is going down that road, it's a road of frustration. And God gives us the law, uh, not as a magnifying glass to look at other people, but as a mirror to look at ourselves. And when we see ourselves through the law, the, the law of God, we have to say, woe is me, for I am undone. And we understand our need. And therefore, we have to look for a different way, another way, which is not a way of law, and self-righteousness, but it is a way of grace. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. But you see, the Lord plays these people. If they're trying to go down that road, he, he explains what that standard is. Now, in verse number 29, it says, But he willing to justify himself, that is the lawyer, and, of course, everybody wants to justify themselves, to make themselves look good. And he says, willing to justify himself, said unto Jesus, and who is my neighbor? And uh, so maybe it's just a few people I have to treat this way. And, of course, that's what they believed. And so we have this story of the Good Samaritan in verse number 13. And Jesus answering said, A certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves, which stripped him of his raiment and wounded him and departed, leaving him half dead. And by chance there came down a certain priest that way. And when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. Do you remember what we taught about almsgiving? Uh, that is benevolent giving. There's three different kinds of giving. There's worship giving, which is tithing. There's benevolent giving. Uh, which is giving what you have, and what the the prince, and then of course then there's faith giving or grace giving, which is giving what you don't have, but the benevolent giving, the secret to benevolent giving, um, or alms giving. The word alms means compassion. The secret is that you see the need, God touches your heart, and you have the ability to meet that need. 
And you put all three of those things together, and that's when almsgiving, benevolent giving takes place. And so we never divorce the perception of the need from the ability to meet that need. If you don't know what the need is, then why would you be even moved to meet that need if you had the ability to meet it? And you'll see that with all these three men, that they saw the person. But only one of these men had compassion or alms. That's the word where the, the word alms comes from. So in verse 31, the priest is there. By chance, there came down a certain priest that way. And when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. He made a conscious choice to harden his heart, to not allow the bowels of compassion to rise up in him, to take pity on the man. He said, no, nope, and he crossed to the other side so he wouldn't have to look anymore or be aware of the man's need. And on he went. Verse 32, and likewise a Levite, a priest, you see, when he was at the place, came and looked on him. So not only did this man see him, but he came, actually, came over and uh, stirred at him. He looked at him. You know, some people get um, some sort of uh, enjoyment out of looking at people in difficult situations. You've heard me tell the story about the car accident up in, uh, on Cades Cove, the road to Cades Cove from Gatlinburg, uh, where the husband died, and we had to rescue the little girl. We were the first people on the scene of that accident, and the mother was badly hurt. We sat there for an hour. There was no communications out, no cell phone, and somebody came by and pressed their own star, and, and uh, finally the... the uh, the EMTs come, came and so on. But I'll never forget, as we were down below the bridge in the water in the river, uh, rescuing this family, and people would come along, and they would look and they would stir. And the amazing thing to me was there were people there with cameras and taking photographs of what was going on, and then they got in their car and left. Why would you even want to take a record of such a thing? Why would you want to stir and gaze upon something without getting involved? It, it just um, it boggles my mind, but some people do that. The great tragedy of this, this hurricane and this area of East Tennessee and uh, North Carolina has never seen anything like this. And many of you have heard the stories and people, um, by way of entertainment, will look at these things online and yet not allow their hearts to be touched about actually doing something. That's somebody else's problem. There's a certain entertainment in it. And so was this Levite. He came and he looked on him. But then he passed by on the other side. Verse 33, but a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was. Now that's the key thing, you see. If you're not there, then you can't do anything. He came where he was. And when he saw him, he had compassion on him. His eye affected his heart, Jeremiah said. In other words, when he saw the need, there's this human compassion that God, I think, has placed on every person, not just saved people. And there is that compassion that ought to well up within every person to take pity on such a person and desire to help that person. I hope all of us are like that. I think there's many unsaved people uh, that express that. There's many people who do not know the Lord, but they will express that compassion. And you might be at the side of the road and someone will stop to help you. You may not even be a Christian. And so this is a trait that God has placed, I think, in every human heart. And when he saw him, he had compassion on him. Now again, it's not just to have compassion and pity and then walk away. But he put shoe leather to this emotion that he was experiencing. So he saw... And he allowed that need to touch his heart. He allowed God to speak to his heart about that need. Verse 34, And he went to him and bound him up, bound up his wounds, pouring in oil and wine. That's what he had. So whatever he had was being used to help this person. Now you can't help a person with something you don't have. And God doesn't require you to give what you don't have. But I think he does require us to give what we do have. And so he poured in the oil and the wine. And he sat him on his own beast. He had a little donkey, I suppose. I guess it was a, a donkey. It could have been a horse. It could have been a camel. I don't know. But whatever it was, he sat him on his beast and brought him to an inn and took care of him. So he wasn't just going to leave him by the roadside. Do what he could. No, he took a personal responsibility 
to put this person on his own beast, and they took him to a place that could help him further. Now, this man was on a journey. He couldn't maybe, there's some limitations to what he could do, but he really employed other people uh, at the end to take care of him. That was what it says. He brought him to an end and took care of him. And on the morrow, so they sped, spent the night, and when he departed, he took out two pence. And remember what a pence was? That what One penny, would, a man would work all day for one penny. So two pence is two days' work. So I don't know what that would be for you, but I'm sure it's, it's quite a substantial uh, sum of money, two days' work. And he, just, he simply takes this two pence, and he gave it to the host and said unto him, Take care of him, and whatsoever thou spendest more, when I come again, I will repay thee. He says, this is all I've got right now. And he gave them those two pence. And he says, now, if there's any more expenses, because I'm coming back again, and I'm going to check on this, there's a personal responsibility. He wasn't just going to leave it and uh, leave it to somebody else. He was going to come back again and check on this man. And he says, if there's anything else that you spend, I will repay thee. Now, Jesus said in verse 36, which now of these three thinkest thou was neighbor unto him that fell among the thieves? And he said, he that showed mercy on him. See, even an unsaved person will, knows the truth and recognizes the truth when he sees it. And then said Jesus unto him, go and do thy likewise. Jesus commanded us to go and do likewise. You see, this man had compassion. And I'll tell you, God is concerned that we have compassion. He is the God of compassion. He is the God of mercy. And if we are his children... He wants that to be reflected in our lives as well. Now, of course, this is where the name Samaritan's Purse comes from. You've heard of uh, the Billy Graham outfit over there in North Carolina. That's their home turf. And, uh, but, of course, they go all around the world. Uh, when COVID hit, they went up to New York and planted hospitals up, uh, these makeshift mobile hospitals and so on. Now, we, we don't agree with everything in the Billy Graham uh, evangelistic crusades and all of that. I can tell you there's things that are lacking. But I'll tell you what, this is one thing to do right. Yeah. Now, there's other groups like Anchor Baptists that have their own disaster relief ministries. Um, but, um, but they put us to shame, I think. Well oil machine. Put the government to shame with what they do. But this is where it comes from. The Samaritan's purse. He took two pennies out of his purse. And he gave them. He gave what he had. And then he promised to come back and to repay uh, the inn owner. Now, this is something I think that reflects well, what we did last week. Um, but I thought about it this way. You know, obviously we see the need, the need is great, and we ought to be touched, and you hear the stories, and I won't repeat the stories tonight, but you've heard some very heart-wrenching stories. Uh, the mother that was on the roof, you know, many of those double wides, they split in half. And uh, the mother and father was on one side, and I think uh, she and her wee boy was on the other side. And the mother and father uh, were swept away, and then the wee boy was swept away. And the last word she heard him say, Jesus, save me. And uh, she lost her mommy and daddy and her seven-year-old boy in that terrible accident and terrible floods. And you can just imagine the emotion. And obviously that should touch our hearts. And we should do more. We should do what we've done and maybe do more. Um, but, you know, it shouldn't be just uh, other people in other places and hurricanes that should allow us to touch. You know, there's probably people here in Warren County that have needs. Now, I know there's people that walk around with their hands out, and that just turns me off. And they come to the, the only time they come to the church is when they come with their hand out. You know, that's, that's a problem for me. But, you know, uh, the thing about almsgiving is that you will see the needs. Not that the person comes to you many times, but you will spot a need. And could it be that there are people all around us that are maybe in this situation? And many times the people who are really deserving of help don't ask for help. Right. And it takes us to look for them and to see them and then to allow our hearts to be moved to compassion yeah. and then to action to do something about it. And so I would challenge, I'm challenging myself. And I want to challenge you tonight. Uh, that, you know, we're all about North Carolina and what has taken place. But what about Warren County and people around us? Maybe there's people right here that need compassion and need our help in some way. Now, of course, we went over there with the, the aim to do something to help somebody. And I think we did help some, some people. But really, my, my uh, goal was not just to help them in a practical way,
Because, you know, we can take a tree off a roof, but if the person is dying and going to hell, it's a temporary solution, isn't it? So we brought boxes of these, and the people we got to speak to, some of the, the people were not there when we were trying to help them, um, but we tried to give them a John and Romans and then an Anchors of Faith, and we'll say a little bit more about that in just a moment, because we want to share Christ with them, which is their greatest need. And so again, may, may God help us to be others-centered. And maybe there's a whole lot more that me and you can do as individuals, as families, but also as our church, as we think about these things. Maybe this is a lesson for us. Anchor Baptist Church, which we'll speak about in just a little bit, is just a small church. It's just a little bit bigger than ours. And yet they have a radio station. They have a Bible school. They have a mission agency. Uh, and this is where, actually, Brother Joel's uh, son-in-law, Levi Trask, uh, Mary Lou's um, uh, husband, is uh, the assistant pastor there, and he was basically helping us with the disaster relief. But they have a whole ministry of disaster relief. Usually they're going to Florida for hurricane relief, or maybe where tornadoes have touched down, and now they're doing it in their backyard. They have a small church, and they have a whole ministry to do that. They have a whole warehouse where they gather things through the year to, to help with that. And maybe there's just maybe there's more in our future about helping uh, people with practical needs, but the ultimate end is to get them the gospel of Christ. And so people, maybe this is what they, they, they don't really understand just yet, but I'll tell you what, they understand love and kindness and help and somebody cutting a tree off their house, they understand what that is. And maybe when they see that and their heart is touched with that, then we can come in with the truth of the gospel and it'll mean something to them. Well, I would like to invite all of our volunteers to come to the front just now, if you would, please. And uh, we're going to give you a microphone, and we'll introduce you. You're all moving very quickly. <laughs> Brother Joel is the first one. Brother Joel, is, uh, he's the, the gaffer, as they would say in Ireland. He's the foreman. Can we turn this microphone on? Thank you. And... Uh, <clears throat> Brother Joel, of course, really was instrumental in putting all of this together because of his relationship with Anchor Baptist and his own um, uh, experience with such things. And, you know, there was 13 of us, but there was, I think, 36 or something all together. The rest of them were his buddies, <laughs> his family and friends. He knows a lot of people. And he was able to make the phone calls and uh, get them all on board. And many young, young men, we were all put in a, a double way. And there was, I think it was 10 of us the first couple of nights. And then, uh, like, there was, there was 26 all together in a double way. So they're all laying on these little mattresses, you know, wall-to-wall uh, -wall mattresses, wall-to-wall. -wall. I have to say, though, that I was well-treated. I got the only bedroom with a bed in it. <laughs> so I slept on a double bed the whole time. I can't complain one bit. And uh, Lord help the other guys. They had to put up with it. But they did. Without complaint, there was no complaints whatsoever. Brother Joel, you tell us a little bit about um, uh, your experience and just about the whole trip. Yes, well, like uh, Pastor said, we uh, asked for 20 guys, and we wound up with just shy of 40. And uh, <laughs> so uh, the first couple of days, I didn't get to do much but just direct. Uh, you know, here's a need. Uh, somebody call. Somebody check this person out, that sort of thing. And and then the whole warehouse uh, staging area, parking lot, uh, everything was crowded, a bustle of activity. And we're coming in through that with trucks and trailers and equipment. And uh, so it took a little bit of traffic direct and, then, uh, and that sort of thing. But uh, uh, we uh, uh, did have some excellent contacts. I know these guys could probably tell you more about boots on the ground than, than I could. Uh, finally, Thursday, I got to go with the crew, and uh, Levi got his first day off since day one and went out to work with us. So, yeah, 20, 20 uh, yeah, 20 some days uh, straight, and so uh, they're, they're in need of a break too, but uh, uh, yeah, so just. Uh, just far worse disaster than than what the news media is, is saying, and uh, uh, but we had uh, uh, definitely some good contacts there. Uh, I know Pastor will tell you about uh, our our last uh, uh, visit and, and 
but um, uh, yeah, the, and, the, and the need is ongoing. So if anyone did not have an opportunity to get involved, there's, uh, we're, we're still taking donations. My daughter and son-in-law are coming for Thanksgiving. It uh, looks like they're going to need to pull a trailer to take uh, take some more donations back with them and that sort of thing. But um, uh, yes, definitely appreciate everybody's support and prayers as we went, and uh, uh, definitely uh, made an impact, I believe, in individuals. And we want to thank you, Joel, for putting all that together. Um, because if, if, if it wasn't for you, we wouldn't have been able to do it. We didn't have the context or anything. So thank you very much. Well, not only did the men go, but we had the ladies go. It was kind of like a last minute thing. But we found out that there was um, uh, accommodations for the ladies. And uh, Miss Julie was the transportation. And Miss Amariah and also Wyatt went as well. And uh, so now they were basically working. We were out in the field and they were basically working in the distribution center. So tell us what you, what you did. Yes, yeah, so we were we were working in the parking lot that was next to the warehouse. Um, there was probably probably a couple hundred pallets that you know went got went through and were just sitting there, um, and we were just breaking them apart and sorting out the different items and repacking them into pallets so that they could get the stuff um, either into the people, warehouse or. People were actually coming in, weren't they? Um, yes, people were were. In the coming through and making donations as we were working. Testing. Um, yes, yes, a lot of the pallets were being um, redistributed to other places that could get them out to those folks in need. Yeah, amen. And people would come in and they would, I mean, I saw a couple going through stuff. Maybe somebody lost all their belongings, you know, and they were coming in looking for clothes and things that they needed for wherever they were because they didn't have a house anymore. Mr. Wyatt, he was working hard, weren't you? Yeah. I saw it was a picture of you on a little buggy. <laughs> We're going to see you in a wee minute. Did you, have, did you have fun? Yeah. Did you work hard? Yeah. I think you did, didn't you? I think he said something this morning to me about wanting to know when we were going back. Is that right? Well, That's cool. Good man. Well, I did see him playing with some of the little girls around, so I don't know if that had anything to do with it or not, you know. Hey, Miss Julie, she is a, she is a go-getter. And what, what was your experience, Julie? Um, I, like, like Mariah said, we were uh, in the distribution part. Um, it's overwhelming. It's, um, it's humbling to see all the things coming in, going out at the same time. Um, I felt guilty when we left because I got up Friday morning and started making chili for here. They got up and, and continued on. Um, this is going to be a long, long time. Um, it's going to take a long time to go through all of this and get it sorted and get it. But then on Wednesday evening, we had service. And you think these people have been hit hard. I can't imagine. We, we heard stories, but you, you can't imagine. And you would think they would be depressed, angry, upset. But they were so thankful and they were so blessed and, and showing humility. And I thought, I don't need your thing. I, I didn't come here to be thanked. Mm. I felt bad. But they were so uplifting. It was, it was a sight. Yeah. So. And, you know, they've been working for like three weeks. I mean, serving. There's one, there's one occasion. They, that little church was feeding a thousand a thousand first responders and different uh, military police and so on. A thousand people a day through their little canteen. It's unbelievable. Amen. Oh, I did. there was a gentleman at the house that we were staying at. Um, he did tell us while we were standing there that he'd gotten a text on his phone. He's not getting his electricity back till December 31st. And his daughter is not getting her electricity back until March. Because they're way out, you know, they're way out in the, in the boonies. Now, I'll have to say, you know, Brother Mark, uh, if you want to take that, he probably doesn't want to say that, but because uh, he's quiet. But I'll tell you what, um, this man was absolutely pivotal, fantastic with the teams. Of course, he was driving one of the trucks, and he really knows how to work that excavator. I don't know if I wasn't there, but I heard stories about him cutting the tree down as he stood on top of a bucket of an excavator that was extended up. 
So you got to close your ears, uh, Miss Farah. And uh, what's that? With a first, he, you were driving it. Oh my goodness! Some That's... of the stories may be exaggerated. I'm not really <laughs> uh, I don't have much to say. I was happy to do what I can. It didn't seem like much. Uh, I would like to thank everybody who helped to make it possible here. Yeah. Yeah. Particularly my wife, who kept home fires burning. Amen. Without that, I couldn't have gone at all. So, that's absolutely I'm glad right. for everybody that helped. Yeah, thank you. Amen. We appreciate you, brother, very, very much. So, him and Kirk were a team, right? And me and Dennis were a team. And then we had the three Musketeers, which was Trevor Reed. His wife was here this morning. They're not members yet, but uh, he had his own track steer, and he brought that down by himself. Do you remember they were the, they were the couple that had the the container in the river? On a, on a trailer, so he just got that trailer out of the river like yeah. the two days before or something. He, he greased up the burns and he drove that thing all the way to North Carolina, Carolina via Atlanta, and it survived it. Um, so anyway, um, so there was David and Trevor and then James were the three musketeers. Well, and brother uh, brother David's going to say a little bit later something there as through the slides. The, the boys were fantastic. They worked hard as well, and uh, they're welcome to say something. One of them didn't want to say anything. What about Nathan? You want to say something? No. Yeah. Go ahead. Sure. Um, I didn't. We didn't really do that much. Um, it didn't seem like it anyway. Sorry, man. Um, it didn't seem like it did that much. Um, although I know we did something, obviously. Sure. But um, we helped. Um, Anthony, I know Anthony and someone else helps in the distribution part up um, for the church, and then um, I mostly helped down where by, where they worked, um, helping um, put the stuff in the goodwill trucks, and then um, sort of stuff like put the cans where the cans were. And you because know, you, if I'm right now, uh, I think they loaded stuff up into trucks to take to other places. Then they 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 were giving stuff away. So Anchor Baptist was like the center. And uh, so their warehouse, they loaded up trucks to take away to other churches uh, or other places to distribute in far off places. And you guys helped to load those trucks up, right? Well, they, were, they, were, they were getting the good stuff that was like already used, like the used clothes, because they okay. weren't taking those in. And they were giving them to Goodwill. And yeah. Goodwill was giving them, to, giving them free to everybody who needed them. Okay, good. Because, you know, some people don't like used clothes. Yeah. Like well, sort them out. Great. Amen. Now, Dennis, he's my wingman. Go ahead and take the microphone there, Dennis. And uh, so, Anthony told me he didn't want to talk about it, so that's why I skipped him. So, anyway, um, you'll, you're going to see some slides and some video tonight that you're not going to believe, but uh, this man was a uh, great, great help to me. And uh, so he was my wingman. Tell us what you think about it. Uh, it was... <laughs> it was a... Uh, uh, just a great privilege and opportunity to just get outside of your comfort zone and um, really put your foot forward um, to not only help individuals going through something that we probably will never go through, but to see um, God's grace and his work through just, um, you know, everybody who came from Calvary. Yeah. It was uh, an amazing, just just to see. It was just amazing. Yeah. Um, we did get into... Yeah, well, we all worked together as a team. Yes. But I know Dennis for sure. Well, all, there's, there wasn't anybody that was dead, dead weird or gold brick, and everybody did what they could. Yes, sir. Um, but he was more than eager to do lots of things that probably I wouldn't have wanted to do anyway. Too eager. Maybe too, too Yeah, eager. probably too eager. <laughs> But we appreciate that, and, yes, and we thank you. Let's give these guys a round of applause. We really appreciate all that you did. Thank you very much. God bless you. All right. Well, let's go ahead, and we'll you all have a seat, and we'll go ahead. At, you know what it's like when you have slides and stuff. And this is a little hint to Brother David, because he's going to be helping me with this. And uh, I don't want to be here till nine o'clock, which we probably could be. Um, but I don't want to be there that long. Dave's going to come in just a little bit after we get through some of the slides tonight. Okay, so we're going to turn this off. And if... Where are these people in the sound room? Do see the one. So I think I'll just stand over here and we'll narrate through this. 
Um, so what, what I hope to do with these slides, and there, you know, and let me just say, there's, there's, and we have this um, credit at, at, on the last slide, but I do want to say um, thank you to Miss Tara, because she basically coordinated all the relief goods, the, all the tubs and everything. She, I mean, and she, had, she had help. Anybody that helped, we are grateful for you as well. But Miss Tara, thank you. And she went out, the businesses, we paid for some stuff. We got think, some things donated and uh, did sterling work with that. So thank you, Tara, for all of your effort. That was a lot of hard work. We pre Let's give her a round of applause too. Yeah, fantastic. And I also want to say thank you to Brother Bowman. Uh, he was, he was going to come, but then he chickened out. And uh, <laughs> not really. He did have other, uh, actually had a funeral to go to of a very important person. But anyway, um, he was up in Indiana, Kokomo, Indiana, and Temple Baptist Church up there provided, I don't know, was it 30-something tubs of, uh, of emergency uh, goods, relief goods, and water. And he brought it. Like he had to drive all the way from Indiana, he left it off here, uh, I think late one night, and we were able to get that. So thank you for, and you for the church. We thank Temple Baptist Church in Kokomo for all of their efforts as well, kind of added in with ours. So anyway, we're going to try to put this into like a video that we can put on YouTube um, and share with other people so that they can see it and have the contact details where they'll be able to um, maybe help have their church help us as well. So I do want to say that this was organised by. Joel Martin, he is the main man in all of this. I'm just a passenger for most of it. Uh, it is sponsored by Calvary Baptist Church with the friends and family of Joel Martin because most of the help that was there. And that we had, I mean, these guys are fantastic with chainsaws and heavy machinery. Unbelievable. We thank the Lord for that. And of course, three Anchor Baptist Church, um, Pastor Randy Barton, lovely man. And of course, uh, Joel's son-in-law, uh, assistant Pastor Levi Trask, and we appreciate all that they did. Church fed us the whole time we were there, looked after us, uh, were very, very kind. Well, this is when we started out uh, on Monday morning, and many of you were here to help us to uh, put the, all the goods into the trailers and so on and help us with that. We sure appreciate it uh, very, very much. Uh, we uh, you see Brother Joel is um, again directing everything, yeah. directing traffic. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> And I, I think I maybe lifted one container. Everybody else was so busy. Uh, we got it all done. There's Brother Herschel. Looks like he's happy uh, with all of that. And all the black tubs with the yellow lids were from Kokomo, uh, Indiana. So, and you can see how, how much of it was there. So that was all greatly appreciated. And of course, some of the folks uh, are not here tonight. Brother Kirk Wagner's not well with sick. And of course, Trevor and, and also uh, James is not here this evening as well. These were actually two dumpster, dumpsters that were stacked on top of one another, which we use when we get out there to put uh, all the debris in and then to cart it away for uh, the rubbish. But we stacked them full of all the stuff um, when, uh, when we went out. Uh, I also want to say a thank you, and have it on here, uh, to Dwayne, uh, uh, Brother Dwayne Hoover, who lent me his truck for the week, which is um, amazing that you would actually trust me with a, a very expensive diesel truck. And it worked flawlessly. And <clears throat> we're very grateful for everybody that, that helped us with that. Um, we didn't, we couldn't go the normal routes like I-40 was shut down, I-26 was shut down. So in order to get over here, you had to go through 74, and that's like a little twisty road. Some of it's okay, but once you go through Nantahela, it's just, um, it's a long, long way over the mountain. And so we had to fuel up the, the trucks. And I will say this, um, the trustees allowed uh, the four drivers, uh, the four trucks, um, an allowance from the emergency fund to fuel. Uh, it took basically $300 for the fuel, and the church, Calvary Baptist, paid for that. We appreciate that very much. <clears throat> so Anchor Baptist Church is in Pisgah Forest, North Carolina. And of course, all the ministries there. And uh, the pastor there, Pastor Randy Barton, and also Pastor Levi Trask, and uh, they were so great and so helpful to all of us. Uh, we got to go to the Wednesday evening service, and Pastor Barton uh, preached and did a wonderful job, and allowed me to give a short testimony and play the bagpipes. I, played, I took the bagpipes with me, I thought, wouldn't that be cool out in the mountains and hear the bagpipes, amazing grace going across uh, the mountain. So all the supplies are free, and you wouldn't believe the stuff. The warehouse was full, the back parking lot was full, the parking lot at the church was full. Wednesday night, we, there was not anywhere to park hardly. 
Um, but that's all the stuff that was donated. And we do thank the Lord for the dry weather. Could you imagine what this is like if it was pouring down with rain? It would just be almost impossible. And uh, I don't know if you can see this little guy on the trolley here. Uh, I think that might be Wyatt Paris. He certainly looks like him. He's moving some supplies around, although he might be just be playing on a cart. I just can't tell the difference. Uh, but anyway, that was good fun. We did have a cloudy day. I think it was Tuesday. Here's people coming. They just come into the parking lot. They come around. They pick out whatever they need. There's no charge. They take whatever they want. And some of these people are coming in absolutely heartbroken because they've lost everything. Also, they did have pallets. when it, We did get a, rain, a little bit of rain one day. And uh, they have these blue uh, pallet covers that they cover everything with. So that's, that's kind of cool. Um, here's the canteen. Um, there's Wyatt again. Uh, Wyatt was always at the canteen. <laughs> no, we eat well. We have to say, and you can eat as much as you want. Uh, there's some more people. Look at the food, fresh fruit and everything. And uh, there's Wyatt again uh, at lunchtime. This was kind of the place where we all met in the morning time to discuss where we were going to go. Of course, Brother Joel, he organized all of that. And um, uh, you can see us meeting there. And, you know, we'd, we'd basically divide up into teams. Uh, and we'd have a name and address, telephone number, and then go to that person's house. Maybe they had a tree on their uh, roof, or maybe there's a tree down in the drive or something like that. And so we'd just get organized and head out. So here, <coughs> this is uh, James and Dennis getting ready. They have chainsaws. They brought us in the warehouse. They, um, we had it. I brought my own chainsaw, but uh, we needed some more. And we went in there, the whole, the whole uh, tray of chainsaws really good chainsaws so this is us getting ready i'm looking a little under the weather right there we just finished the job so there we are <clears throat> now this is uh swananoa in north carolina you may have heard about it on the news this was actually <clears throat> dennis and i went here well actually all the team brother joel was there uh on the thursday and we drove through this this is these are photographs that we took and you just can't describe the devastation um, buildings completely gone, cars upside down, still there, basically. These big boulders were washed down with the water. Um, I want you to notice uh, over here, um, you see that? That's a big pile of just boulders everywhere that was washed down in, in, in the river, in the torrent. Uh, these are houses that um, are just taken off their, their foundation. You can't see, I should have took the picture, but there's actually a truck stuck into the back of that house at the back. Um, you see the silt, the silt is absolutely everywhere and it's like a fine, uh, it's like a fine dust, it's, it's, uh, it's very strange, same colour, just brown, where there used to be green grass, it's all just all brown now, all the buildings completely wrecked, you can see that whole, it's a carpet factory, the walls are dented in, everything's gone, um, then just trash piled up on the side of the road. This is also um, in West Asheville. Uh, we were coming in, this is where the last person, uh, Josie Clark, we're going to talk about her in just a moment, but again, they just leave stuff out here, and nobody's picking it up, so it's, it's just a mess, it'll be a mess. This is three weeks into this, and it's still um, just terrible. You're driving down the road, you see things like this, a little camper van, can't really see it from that angle, but the whole side of it is ripped off, and again, it was carried downstream. This was the one that got my attention, this is a big RV. And it's, it's uh, basically, you know, I don't know how many feet this is off the ground. This is a big uh, trellis in the park there. And, uh, but that's probably 20 feet off the ground and just pinned onto that wooden structure. And the whole RV just ripped the bits. And you're just driving down the road and you see this and you think, you know, am my eyes deceiving me? It's just absolutely um, incredible. Well, this time I want uh, David to come uh, because David and James and Trevor... Uh, one of their teams went up into the mountains where they had severe, severe damage. And uh, they went to help. Um, there was a couple of families there, a couple of homes. Come on, David, if you would. And he's going to take you through the rest of, I think, the next 17 slides and uh, share with you what happened up there. So we'll give you five minutes to do that, brother. <laughs> <laughs> is this one on? Yeah. That white one, the top one, is, is what, what advances it. All right, um, can I take that one out? Yeah. So this is this going to feed back at all? Um, I want to start out by something that I think is the most important thing to take away from this, and it's Isaiah 
um, chapter 6, verse 8. And it says, Also I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? And who will go for us? Then I said, Here am I. Or here am I, send me. And uh, that's going to come back in this presentation. But um, the ministry of the church is to go. It's to take care of widows. It's to take care of orphans. It's to take care of people like this. And in America, we've forgotten that. The church has forgotten that we're supposed to go. And I can tell you, when I was there in Green Mountain, there was no one there. No government, federal government, no state government, no county government, no anything, nothing, just us. So um, I hope I don't take too long, but this really affected me. And I've been thinking about it, uh, waking up at night, just, just uh, thinking about it. So. Green Mountain is a population of about 650 people up in the mountains. It's in the middle of nowhere. The uh, tow, Where we were, the Tow River runs through Green Mountain. And um, this is where we worked. Um, is the point is the pointer here? Uh, top one? Okay, this stretch here from the bridge to Bee Branch Road, that's probably a half mile. At least eight people died right there. At least. The only people that are alive today is this man right here, his son and his wife. The only people left alive. This right here, um, the island. This is probably from here to here is 500 yards. I'm pretty good with distances because I shoot distance. That's probably 500 yards across. The river came and undercut the road right here. So much so that there was only one lane and it was all undercut and it was not safe to walk on. Um, five houses that are in this picture are not there anymore. They're in the river somewhere upriver. The, a family... A mother and a father and two children, this, this man, he's the only one left alive there, just him. And he watched a mother and a father and two children just whoosh, swept away in an instant, gone. Still haven't found him. And his other neighbors on the other side, gone, dead. So it's, um, the destruction is, it's, it's unimaginable. Um, this is the bridge. You can see a car there. That bridge is about 50 feet tall. Those trees are probably a couple hundred feet across and about 30 or 40 feet deep. Um, and you come in. You you come into Green Mountain. It, it was <laughs> it was James and um, and Trevor and I, and we're driving down the road. And as we're driving down the road, I mean, we're passing cars: Texas, Pennsylvania. Uh, Illinois, Iowa, Idaho, and everything's just normal going down a four-lane road, and we're like, where, where is all this? And We took a left and went down Bee Branch Road, and when we got on probably 100 yards down Bee Branch, Bee Branch Road, we all just, our mouths kind of dropped open. I mean, a shipping container twisted, torn, um, tractor trailer up in a tree I mean it I call it the zone when, when you when you get off the road there you go from uh, from normal what you're used to seeing and you go into the zone I call it and the brain the subconscious brain has something called a normalcy bias and you're used to seeing every day you're seeing houses and cars and trees and people in in a normal what you think is orientation when you go into the zone, everything changes, and it and you don't realize it until you leave. But y your new normal is now there, and your new normal is a house upside down in a river with 
all the gas pipes sticking out. A tree uh, upside down, you know, sticking its roots out. I mean, millions of them. A, a, a car impaled on the bridge, just smushed like a like a ball of tin foil, um, and mudslides everywhere. Um, again, no sound, no electricity, no water, no anything. It's just it's 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 like a moonscape. It's just foreign. Um, here's where again part of the road is washed away. Um, again, the road washed away. Um, just debris. Th this river, uh, the drop off. If I can go backwards, the drop off here is about 30 feet. But if you look on the trees surrounding this, the, the water line is 20 feet over the road. So the river rose 500 feet or 500 yards wide and 50 feet. And the violence, the violence accompanied, that accompanied that is, is unimaginable. Um, Kirk, I think he'll show, he'll, he'll, I think there might be a picture of it here. Um, this is the bridge that um, we built to the island. Um, our last detail of the day was to search for dead bodies, which I really wasn't expecting to do, but who will go? You know, when they point to you and there's no one else around and they say, you know, come on, we need you, you know, you just go. And uh, I mean, I said, I don't know anything about finding dead bodies and they said, well, you're going to smell them. It was kind of a disgusting thought, but it's reality. And they did find uh, body parts out here. Um, no, there's, I asked them, I said, what are we looking for? And, and they said, when you smell something, just put a marker there. And I said, are we going to find something? And they said, you're not going to find a body. You're going to find parts. And uh, I think on the island, I think that the thing that rattled me the most was we, we had a seven-man team, and we, the, the island's about 100 yards wide, and, and I had the far left on the water, and then we, we went down. So you sweep the island, and you walk together, and I, you're by yourself. You're crawling, you're crawling on your hands and knees under trees and, and, and in caves, and, and I came across a, a child's life preserver, just like the one my daughter has, exactly like it. And I, I sat, I looked at it and I sat down and I, I just, I looked at it for about five minutes. I didn't want to, I didn't want to pick it up. I was afraid what I was going to find underneath it. Um, and fortunately when I picked it up, I didn't find anything underneath it, but it, 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 it was really, uh, it wasn't, it's not, it was not a nice feeling. Um, this is a, this is a young man and, and this is where I got the, the, the quote from Isaiah. This young man is 25 years old. He's from Idaho. He drove all the way from Idaho with that mini excavator. And on the side of his mini excavator is the verse from Isaiah. And he, he answered the call and he came. And uh, God bless him. You know, um, because oh, I'll tell you, tell you a little bit more when I tell you about Lynn Peterson. Um, that's a car. Um, these are, of course, cars. The mudslides were, were really bad here. Uh, this is a house that we cleaned out. They had four feet of sand in their house. And we cleaned that out and ripped out the drywall and ripped out the floors. And, um, the, of course, they have no power. And they, they had frost that night. Um, and they're living. They're living. The mother, the fa they're the only ones living in that area. The mother, the father, and the son are living on about a... They're living in the kitchen because we tore out all the floor and walls. It's the only place they have because we're torn out so it'll dry. So they're living on generators and and uh, just trying to stay warm. Um, again, the same place. I don't even... I can't remember their names. Um, this is... That's the island from the road. This You can see where the... <laughs> where the, the water just came right up to the, to the edge of the road. Tough to see in the video. And, and I'll be honest with you, I only took one picture. I, I just was so overwhelmed. Um, and there's even, you know, this, this guy I met here, Bryce, um, we, we scouted on our motorcycles because we could go places that other people couldn't. 
but um, Bryce's former special special forces and, and his team was all special forces from the military, and they were the cadaver people. Um, but he told me that there are people that um, up from bad elements that tried to join them and, and intermingle with them to to take advantage. So, you know, it's it's, it's not all good. But um, what's that? I mean, there's bad element there too. Uh, you know, people are going to take advantage of a situation. Um, this is probably the, the the what I'm closest to, um, Lynn Peterson. This is his, his grandfather, Finn. And Finn started his store in 1962, and he sold uh, the the, the uh, wood building right next door is is the one that um, that sells the sandwiches. But that's that's the gas station part of it. Finn started in 1962, and then his son took it, and then his grandson, which would be Lynn, took took over the the business. I don't know. Lynn's probably in his mid 60s, but he told me. We were scouting. I was with Bryce scouting, and, and this is the first sign of life we saw in like five miles. It's because there's just no, no people, no nothing, just, just nothing, and it's kind of it was impassable. We we went on our dirt bikes, um, so Lynn was in his store at nine o'clock in the morning, and at nine o'clock in the morning the water started coming under the door. At nine thirty it was up to past his waist. They tried to get out the back, couldn't open the doors. They had to break out the windows and go out the windows. And they finally, they got out and they said within a half hour, the water was 12 feet over the top of the store. And then a half hour later, it was back down to normal. But when the water cleared, that building right there, that beautiful uh, clapboard-sided building that, he, that Lynn is known in the county for serving the best sandwiches, was a, it's a pile of sticks. It, it's just not even recognizable. And he has no insurance. And he left his safe open, so all his valuables washed down the river. And he has, he has nothing. And he, when we met him, he was, he's just shell-shocked. He just, he, and I, I talked to him today, actually. Um, he wants us to come over and, and help him burn his, the debris from his store. Um, but he's just heartbroken, and he's, he's his sister's house, who lived next door to him and his brother's house were, were both destroyed. His is the only one. His is the highest, so it's still standing. He's there alone. He's been alone for three weeks. Um, he's just, I, I don't know what he, he's feeling, but because he's lost everything. And uh, it's, he told me that no one has come from the, the feds, no one has come from the state, no one's come from the county, no one's come to help. But one thing that you notice Every church that's in the zone, there's piles of stuff, water, food, blankets. It's every church, every single church. And it's, I've never, uh, I've never witnessed a church just step up like they have. Every single church we saw, you know, and, and when we talked to people, we told them where we were from and, and I was in such a, I was so shell shocked. First of all, because of what I was seeing, and also because I had three crews, and I kind of de facto became the the leader. And what we did is we just stood in the middle of the intersection right there at uh, B Branch and and Tow River, and anybody that passed by, we said, "Do you need help?" "Yes, we need help. Can you dig us out?" I mean, we I, we had guys going every which way. I mean, I couldn't even keep track of them. They were coming and going. They'd finish one job, and they'd, they'd, they'd have another neighbor that wanted to do, do a job. And, and it just, the, the good that we got to do for people just in this, this little, you know, couple miles of, of river, I don't even know what we did, some of the stuff we did, because I, I didn't, the, the, the Muddy Pond boys did a, did a lot. Those guys were great. Young, strapping, 25-year-old men, you know, just raring to go. And they were ripping off drywall and, you know, and they were thanking me for getting in the work. You know, they were just happy to, to help. And I, I really like those guys. Um, that's, again, Lynn's store. Um, and uh, I'm just honored to, uh, to have, a, have a chance to help. Uh, I don't feel I, I did a whole lot. And, and there's, there's so much more to do, so much more to do. And, and they're cut off. They're just, they're cut off from the world. And the only reason that we could help them is because we went. 
Yeah. And we were there, and we, we were available to 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 do to do something. Yep. You gotta go. You gotta go to where they are. So, um, and uh, thank you, David. Um, and of course, he was in an area where we weren't, and it was all different. This was like hardcore stuff where he was, where we were, maybe not so much, uh, but the needs were all over the place. Well, what we were there to do was to make a difference, and we we we, we tried our best. Again, it felt like a, a drop in the ocean. Uh, this was our team. I went uh, with the two teams together, um, Brother Mark and myself, and. Uh, Dennis and Kirk were together. Uh, this was a situation where they wanted us to repair this bridge. And sometimes we couldn't make a difference because we just didn't have the equipment to do it. We, we didn't have the crane to lift this, and so we really couldn't do anything here. Uh, this was a landslide right here at the top. There's actually a house up there um, that almost went, but this is a landslide that came down, covered this whole area. There's another two or three houses up this lane, and they wanted us to clear that out. Well, we got there... I want to say it was like 11 o'clock in the morning and somebody had already been there. We were kind of disappointed because somebody else had stole it and they, they did the job before we got there. So we got there. It took us an hour to get there. And some of the places we went through, uh, rivers just washed out. You saw an old like, 50s black car right in the middle of a stream somewhere, half buried in silt. Just un un unbelievable, surreal. But anyway, so some of the places we couldn't do the work. Uh, we had to get in our car or our trucks and head back. And... Uh, this was um, the next job that we had this day. This was a, an elderly man. He wasn't actually here, it was his neighbor uh, that directed us to this. And of course, this tree was across. Now, this was three weeks, three weeks later, and the roof had been perforated uh, with one of the branches. And you say, in fact, um, uh, Brother Joel's uh, youngest brother, Jay, was going to have me and Dennis go do this. And I kind of said to him, you know, I think that's kind of a little bit beyond my skill level. You know, I, I cut firewood and stuff, but this is, you know, but anyway, they saved us, they came with us, and uh, this is what happened uh, here. That's the, the uh, neighbor in the gray uh, sweatshirt. <clears throat> so you start by taking all the loose stuff off. And again, no insurance. So if we didn't do it, it would still be, it would still be like that. Uh, so we cut the smaller branches off, and then this is when we cut the big one. And we're putting it away. And then we had to cut all that up and get it off. There's a big ravine there and a road at the bottom and the water plugged up, the silt plugged up the, the conduit and the water rose probably about 40 feet, went over the road, ripped all the tarmac up and so they had uh, just a temporary gravel place in the road there. But I couldn't believe how deep it was and the water came all the way up at the overflow of that road. It was incredible. Um, but they, they tarped it and everything and left it as good as they could. And the neighbor friend was so happy. I mean, these people are just overjoyed with what we were able to do. He sent his wife to go get pizza. So it was about 20 minutes for the pizza to come. So while we were waiting on the pizza, what else do you do but... <laughs> you have a little bagpipe concert out in the middle of the weed. So anyway, they had fun with that. Um, then this was the last day. The last day for me was the best day because of what we were able to get done. And, and we'll show you this. I may be over here in about five minutes. But uh, this was the church. This is uh, Swanoa, Swanoa Heights Baptist Church, Independent Baptist Church. This is their back parking lot. There's a stream uh, that comes down here. Um, and it just ripped. These are conduits that brand new they put in back in June. And it just filled them full of silt. And then the water goes over the parking lot, rips all the tarmac up. It's just an absolute disaster. I did see video of the water coming across here, and it's just uh, incredible. Uh, so here's uh, our foreman directing traffic. And of course, we had all the big machinery. And we literally had to take all of that, uh, all of the... Um, uh, all of the pipe out, and I'll show you the next video here, It'll empty the, all the silt out. Now, this is our good friend Dennis, and this is the thing that you shouldn't be doing, because yeah. they put it, if OSHA sees this, we'll be probably taken to court, I don't know. But we, the, the last pipe was a, con, a steel conduit, corrugated pipe, and it was, it was full, it was still water was getting through just a little bit, and we were trying to poke a hole in it. And so I cut a, a tree branch, or tree trunk down, small one, 
and uh, we were trying to push this string through the conduit and so the chain was around it so we could pull it back out again and then he was sitting on the bucket holding the end of the tree against the bucket as the as the workman was pushing it into the into the conduit and back out again and uh we we said we didn't want to show this uh to danny you know but um but here it is and there he is that's what i'm saying he did stuff that i wouldn't want to do there's the there's the steel conduit there and he's pushing that thing in to try to clear it so we ended up um you know cleaning all that up and in the process um i'll just show you this next one actually here's the big pipe that we had to take out by the machines full of silt and dirt just unbelievable and of course without those machines you just could not do uh, any of this work and the pastor and the people were so appreciative of us doing that obviously it's saving them money down the road i wish we could have got it all cleaned out and passed it up and put the conduit back and filled it back in again but we just were unable to do that uh, we could have done a temporary job but they wanted to do it right so they'll just have to wait on that and so we just have the stream coming down there and uh, these guys are unbelievable with these machines um, see the dirt just falling out of it now they took the bobcat went down below uh, to the neighbor's property it was still the church property but it bordered on the neighbor's property there's a man down there um, his name was Dan and he was absolutely really frustrated he was actually living in a little shack and i kind of saw him from a distance and the other guys were down there and he was giving them what for he was cussing them out and oh he was so angry and so mad don't really know why because later on he told me that they'd done a good job and uh you know putting the, the little stream in the way but he was down there he was throwing stones down and he had a shovel out and he was giving it all this and he was literally cuss cussing these young fellows out. So I kind of let it go for a while. I, you know, don't take a dog by its ears, the Bible says, because you'll get bit. But anyway, knowing me, I thought, I'm going to go down and talk to him. So I went down, and, I, he's, and he started in on me. So I said, you know, we're, we're here from Middle Tennessee. We're just here to help people. We're not charging anything. The church here had problems. And he says, yeah, I know. And uh, uh, he showed me actually a video of the water coming down. And he said, you know, we're just here. So he heard the accent. He, I says, well, what's your name? He says, they call me Don. He says, but my real name is Brendan or Brandon, which is an, an Irish, it's actually an Irish saint, Brendan, St. Brendan. So he grew up as a Roman Catholic, but now he's an atheist. And uh, boy, he was really upset, you know. And I told him why I was an American, told him my testimony, and told him what the Lord had done for me. And he didn't believe any of that, you know. And then I showed him some, uh, some of the videos. That video was showed you the tree on the house. I showed him that video. And he said to me, you know, I have a, a, a friend. She's, she's, like, she's probably like late, late 70s, maybe 80 years old. She lives over in West Asheville. And she has a very similar thing. Uh, a tree fell on her house. The contractors won't touch it because they're after the big money and the big jobs. And nobody's helped them whatsoever. He says, well, give me your name and number. So he gave me her name and number. So I go up to the guys. I says, can we do this? And they said, yep, we can do this on the way home. It's on the way home. We can do it. So I went down, went to the, the truck and opened the boxes up. And I got these. And I went down to Brendan. And I spent about the next 15 minutes going through the anchors of faith with him. I says, now, uh, we're going to do this job for your friend. And here's all I want you to do. I want you to take this booklet and I want you to carefully read it. Oh, he says, I have to give you money. I says, we're not doing it. We're not after money. We don't want money. I says, I just want you to read that little booklet. Would you? He says, he says, normally, I wouldn't even dream of opening a book like that. He says, but because you've come like this, he says, I will promise you I will read it. But I have to give you some money. I says, we're not interested in money. He says, if you don't, if you don't take this money, I won't read that book. <laughs> He got me. So he went to the shack. It was literally a shack. He went into the shack and he came over the, the little stream and he had five $20 bills in his hand. He handed me $100 and I said, right. And I, I said, now you read that and we're going to go see. Her name was Josetta, Josetta Clark. The funny part was I was coming up and all the young fellows were sitting there that had been cussing out all day. And I says, the guy just gave me $100. <laughs> and they said, what did you say to him? You know? <laughs> What in the world? How in the world could you get $100 out of him? I said, well, you know, you just got to be prayed up. You know, that's all I can say. <laughs> so anyway, we got in the trucks and we went to Josetta's house. Now, Josetta, she's a wee woman about that tall with blonde hair. And uh, 
This was the church that we helped. They fed us a meal, and then we left Swanona, go through all that wreckage again to go to West, um, West Asheville. This is her house up here. Now, you can't see it from the front, but there's a big old tree on the back. It was all covered in ivy. Her whole backyard was just covered, overgrown with everything. So this is Joe Shadow Clark's home. Uh, here's where the dumpsters come in. These are the dumpsters where we put all the totes in. Well, now the totes are gone. This is where we put all the rubbish. And uh, here's a young fella uh, doing all the work up there. And uh, this is her little house. You see those steps there? Brendan made those for her. She told me that he was a Catholic um, 20 years ago was Mother Day, and he lost his faith. He's never been back in the atheist ever since, you know. But it's an amazing thing, because I could, I could see God working, and I think I could sense that God was answering prayers. Your prayers, our prayers. Because so, I want to help people, but you know what? I want to give them this. I want to tell them about Jesus. And the, that, that guy, that, there's no way that Brendan was going to listen to anybody, but the Lord just opened that door. So anyway... Uh, here she is. The tree is, uh, here's the excavator here. The tree was up all over in here. They ripped all that out. This, this tree here right behind the excavator, uh, that was all rotten. They took that out. Her car was in the way. We didn't start, so we backed this, the, the excavator up to the car and, and jumped the car, got the car running, and left it running away. We were doing all the work so her car and I can run. And so she's just a wee woman about that height. So I started talking to her, and then I gave her the anchors of faith, and, and she started crying. And uh, I, I brought her down onto the porch here, and, and uh, she gave me a hug, you know. And, and I, I put my arm around her, and I says, uh, she, she grew up in First Baptist. In fact, she grew up in this house. Here, this is a craftsman's house. Can't see it here. But um, uh, at one time, it was a beautiful home. And she grew up, there's a little girl. All of her memories are there. And she was telling me about her life and stuff. But she could not get over the fact that we were there to do that for her. And she started crying and she was hugging me. And I said, let me pray with you. And so I prayed with her. And uh, I'm not sure if she's saved or not. But I told her, now, I want you to do the same thing I've asked uh, Brendan. I want you to read this wee booklet. Would you do that? Oh, she says, I will. So I gave her my card. She's got the anchors of faith. And then she started taking photographs for the insurance. And I said, now, I want you to take a photograph of me with this thing in the background, and I want you to send it to Brendan, okay? And I know she'll have been talking to Brendan. But you know what? That compassion and that love, and really it was the direction of God that sent us there, to open hard hearts so that the gospel can get in, and maybe that seed that is planted will bring forth fruit. And so we want to thank um, our church as we continue to pray for all those affected by the hurricane. That's East Tennessee, North Carolina, Virginia, other places. And we want to put this together where people can... Um, uh, and let me just mention this, that Watson's equipment, and of course this is all due to Brother Joel, Watson's equipment gave us for the week free of charge, I think, was it two skid steers? Skid steer and an and a excavator. And then MTR gave us a, another skid steer, right? And I think Watson's gave us one trailer, and then... Uh, Brother Mark's uh, friend, uh, Phil Laverat, gave us a trailer. And then Dwayne Hoover lent us a diesel truck. And then Brother Eric's up here in Temple Baptist Kokomo and the, all the volunteers. 23 other volunteers from Manchester, Muddy Pond, Monterey. And uh, there may be other places there. Maybe you'll let me know. But I think uh, those three places and, of course, the pastor and staff, volunteers of Anchor Baptist Church, that made it all work. So praise the Lord. Well, you know what? Just before we go, we're not going to sing, but let's just pray. And uh, just for a few moments, and ask the Lord to be with these people, and the people who are helping these people. And maybe there's another opportunity for us to go back. Brother Jules mentioned this, and maybe there's something more that we can do and be involved with this. So let me, let's pray together. In fact, let's all stand, please, if you would. As we close our service, let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for the privilege of serving you, of knowing you.